Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talk of the Town, looking a little bit different uh, than Talk of the Town usually does because everything is these days. Anyway, a familiar face is joining us um, today for a uh, regular legislative update, which we are conducting remotely, of course, as everything is these days. But anyway, welcome to Cindy Friedman, our state senator and one of uh, my favorite people to talk to and check in with regularly uh, throughout the year. So Cindy, thanks for joining us. Um, Jane, how are you? I am doing okay. Um, probably very similar to, uh, to you and to the rest of our audience kind of squirreled away here in my, in my own home office, as I'm sure you are, uh, yep. and getting business done as best we can. Um, so let's get right to that. Obviously, uh, I and others are curious just about how, how are our legislators uh, conducting business these days in, uh, in the coronavirus and social isolation environment. So tell us a little bit, how, how are you getting things done? A lot of conference calls and a lot of Zoom. Um, we are, I think, one of the Silver linings of this is that we have amazing technology. And um, in fact, I probably spend more time in meetings now than I did before the um, coronavirus because we're all in one place. Uh, you know, we're all in, at home. We're easy to get to. Um, we don't have to worry about, well, I can't come out here because, it, you know, I have a meeting over here. And so I don't have the time. Everything's just bam, bam, bam. Everybody's right there so uh lots of conference calls lots of zoom um and um a lot's getting done i have to say yeah i can i can appreciate the fact that to the extent that what you're doing needs conferring and needs you basically just to be in consultation and deliberation um, and processing with others that as you say this is a bit of a silver lining because uh, i have certainly found as everybody else has people are on the other end when you call um, in general because it's not hard to track you guys down. Um, what, what's, what is missing though? What do you find that you're just not being able to get done um, because of the current constraints? Well, anything outside of uh, an issue addressing this virus is something that we're not getting done. I mean, it is, it is this work um, to address these, this pandemic every minute of the day. And um, <clears throat> there was not, there's really not bandwidth right now for anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering also whether there might just be, you know, having, not having access to, I don't know, objects or sites or things like that, how big a problem that might be for you. Anyway, it just sounds like your lives are being dominated as are all of ours uh, by, by the virus. So let's talk about uh, legislation that is uh, either already been passed in process or that we can expect uh, related to the virus. So um, I can ask you about specific areas or just kind of invite you to share with us in your own order of priority uh, some of the things that are being tackled. Okay, so I think the first thing uh, that I would say or the first context I would put things in is we are looking at anything, any legislation, any activity uh, by the Senate that requires immediate attention. Um, that is something that is facing the Commonwealth at this moment and that we need to respond to. So that's fallen recently into a, a few areas. One of them is uh, health care, and we did the scope of practice bill. We also did a telehealth bill. Um, we did a prior auth bill, and then the so governor... What let me just jump in and say scope of practice, that's not, not self-evident to me. So what, what do you so, mean? What we've done is we have legislation to ensure that everybody in the medical profession is working to the top of their license. So I'll give you an example. A nurse practitioner by license can um, do treatment. They can do diagnostics, they can prescribe, they can, um, uh, they can admit people to a hospital. 
but our licensing, our rules say they have to do that with the supervision of a doctor. So they have to be under the supervision. So that means that every nurse practitioner needs to be working for a doctor, okay, or under the supervision of a doctor. We really need nurse practitioners. We need them out in the field and we need them to do the work that um, is going to keep people healthy, not only the COVID-19 uh, positive people, but people who need care. So their ability to, to be able to prescribe um, is really important because then we don't need, uh, the doctor can be working or looking at something much more um, detailed or needing more experience. And so um, what we've done in our bill and then the, the governor adopted it and did it through executive order was say, okay, all nurse practitioners can work to the top of their license. So now they can prescribe. Now you can see a nurse practitioner and if you have a strep throat, she can say, okay, um, I'm gonna give you some pen, you know, antibiotics and then she can do the, scri do the scribing and you can go and get the antibiotics. And she doesn't need a doctor to be supervising that. And so that's really covered in, um, that's really covered, excuse me, in uh, nurse practitioners, advanced psychiatric nurse um, workers and uh, um, the the other one is um, just just went out of my head. Oh, uh, CNAs, um, certified nurse anesthetists. Okay, excuse me. I'm going to close the door. Sure. Okay. So that's well, a scope. Of, that's a scope of practice. Okay. Yes, and I know you had mentioned a number of other things as well, and and happy to get you to elaborate on those. But I did want to say that. That's a great illustration, what you just uh, told us, great illustration of a couple of things, it seems to me. One is, you know, what it is that we need our legislators to be doing in terms of addressing this phenomenon. Um, you know, we need as a society, obviously, to give the maximum flexibility to our medical establishment as, as they can have at this time. Uh, that's in everybody's interest. So the fact that the that you in the state house, you're the ones who can, again, as you say, uh, uh, affirm or 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 legitimize the the this this broadest possible use of people's skills. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And then the second thing that it reminds me of is the fact that, of course, we are all consumed um, all day, every day, with news about the virus, et cetera, and consciousness. Uh, in our own lives about it, um, but we need to remember that the, that doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners, et cetera, are all taking care of a lot of different maladies, all the same ones that they always have. And uh, I think that, uh, again, it's a great illustration and reminder that part of what you're doing is just enabling uh, those in the medical uh, establishment to do the work that they generally do and still need to be doing even in the face of this. Right. Um, so that's that's just an example on the healthcare side. Then um, another uh, pieces that we've been looking at and actually did a bill was a municipal bill around elections and um, and you know pushing out some of the elections, allowing for more uh, mail uh, mail in ballots. Yep. Um, that was something that was passed and signed by the governor. Um, so there's the whole kind of municipal piece and the pieces of how we keep local governments uh, moving. We have another bill that is uh, um, being worked on by the Senate and the House to expand that around um, uh, things like remote um, meetings, notaries, you know, all this, all of these things that you just don't even think of because they're part of your daily life. And now all of a sudden, how do you have a selectman's meeting when, um, you know, when you can't come into a building and you need to follow the open meeting laws? Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, and obviously we, everybody listening in here is going to know that this directly pertains to Arlington, both in terms of the election and, and needing to get, uh, you know, some, to have some more flexibility around when to reschedule our local election. Okay. Yeah, and then we've got select board meetings and other meetings going on and, where you need town meeting. We have, you know, we are required by law to have a balanced budget in by July, you know, but done for the fiscal year. Well, how do you do that when you can't meet? How do you do that when, 
you know, um, when all of these offices are closed and people can't do their work, we have to allow for life to go on. So those are, those are the, that's that area. Um, and mm -hmm. that's something the Senate and the House have been working on together. Um, the safety net issues, okay, around unemployment insurance mm -hmm. and homeless and um, homelessness and shelters and the whole financial piece of keeping our healthcare system up and running um, during this time. So those are the areas that we are focused on in the Senate and anything we can do in as quickly a manner as we can do it, that's what we're focused on. And I know that there's a great connection between the Senate president and the administration. So sometimes we do this work and it feels like we say, this is what we're doing. And then the governor goes, okay, we'll do it in executive order, which, you know, for a minute is frustrating and beyond that it's like, great, it's getting done. It's done. Mm -hmm. great. So, right. Obviously the most important thing is that this, this stuff get, get done, done, however, right. get it, it however done. it happens. Right. Yeah. I mean, a couple of other areas that, uh, that we want to make sure that we touch on is, I know that there has been some legislation recently around uh, kind of landlords and, and tenants yes. as well, who are obviously, especially in a stay at home environment, um, uh, obviously there are going to be issues arising there. Right. So the how the, the Senate has, I think either we've released it today or tomorrow, and we're going to bring it up on Monday, is a housing bill. So the first part of the housing bill, my understanding is, is that it will put a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. Um, and it will have some other pieces in it about Airbnb rentals and hospital and, and hotels and creating spaces for healthcare workers to be able to, you know, rent a place by the hospital or or make it easy, um, but otherwise closing those uh, some of those down so that we don't have people coming into the state and um, increasing our chances of, of uh, infection. So that's happening. I know in the Senate is supposed to, we will be bringing that up on Monday. Um, and then, and then, so that will be the first, I mean, the other piece to, to know is that that will be the first iteration. And then after we do that, there'll be a next iteration and a next iteration, right? So we're, we're doing immediate chunks and, and, the the pieces at the top of the priority list and then we're going right back and going down the list so um i know there's a lot of people that want to um uh, prohibit foreclosures completely for instance or prohibit evictions well that's a little more complicated to do than put a moratorium on the moratorium on them so instead of saying well we're gonna have to work everything out before we do something let's do the let's do the quick things first and then we'll keep working on the more complex issues and that's what we've been doing in the Senate. that's a it's a great point and i'm just curious is, has that been a at all a hard sell with any of your colleagues do you have anybody who's resisting because they want to get more done on the initial stages or do you does everybody recognize that you need to do this in an over a number of steps and stages it's hard for some people i mean some people see this as an opportunity and you know maybe rightly so doing things that we should be doing we should do anyway right and um so yeah there's a pushback i mean the advocates are pushing for as much as they can get which advocates do and should do that's their job and um it doesn't sit well with everybody but uh in the senate but but it is there's a pretty general agreement that we're going to keep moving and I don't think anybody is to the point where they're going to try and stop something from happening because it doesn't have enough in it. Um, I think they're going to keep pushing and that's their job is, you know, keep pushing, keep get. I do it. I try and get everything I can get into something. And then at some point I say, okay, that's it. I get it. Do this. I'll come back and bother you about the next thing. <laughs> right. And as you say, that is the job. So uh, do we get right? Job, right. Right. requires that yeah um so um i wanted to just ask you obviously everybody is very aware of this uh unimaginably large uh two trillion dollar spending package uh that the you know that the, the federal legislature has uh passed and it's been signed by by the president um 
obviously some of that money is going to be coming to Massachusetts. Um, how, how does that kind of thing happen? How, how much are you going to be involved uh, in the, in the state Senate um, with rapidly figuring out how to take X chunk of money and apply it uh, to Y area in a way that's effective. Is that going to be taking up uh, expected to take up a lot of your time and in, in, in energy in the next little while? Greater minds are thinking about this than I. Okay, we'll start with that. Um, I think it really depends on, from my understanding is, it depends on what the, what the chunk of money is for. So unemployment insurance, lots of that is federal. So it's just gonna, it, it's part of the federal U, uh, um, unemployment insurance piece. Now the state has pieces of unemployment that they do, but a whole bunch of that is federal. Okay, now you apply through the state and that's an issue. But um, in terms of the um, healthcare space, some of that is gonna go directly to, uh, let's say there's money, there's a billion dollars, I think that's gonna come directly to hospitals. And I know the first round of that 25 billion is gonna be sent to hospitals directly um, based on their number of beds that they have and whether they're in a hot spot. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm sorry, the hundred billion dollars of that is for is for hospitals. If I didn't say that right, and um, right. I think okay, so that's going to be done by a formula. Now there is more money coming to hospitals for safety net hospitals or um, uh, disproportionate share hospitals. Just disproportionate shares for hospitals who have more Medicaid and Medicare than commercial. Um, that's, we're all kind of trying to figure out, okay, how is that money, um, how is that money to be allocated and how do we want that money to be allocated? Can we, can we influence the feds in how that money comes? So those are two examples of um, money that we're gonna be seeing and some, in some ways we know the, how it's going to be um, proportioned, and in some ways we don't know yet. So things are up in the air, but you can be you can rest assured that the state is looking very, very carefully at that because they want to make sure that they get um, all the money they can that they that comes to Massachusetts. Right, of course, and uh, I appreciate your you know, being able to answer that question to any degree because of course there's so much uncertainty about you know exactly when things arrive and how, how it is that that's gonna be processed. I think those of us out here just kind of, we hear that such a package gets passed and then we just assume that, oh, we're, well, we're awaiting our checks in the mail, but also, you know, that it's just going, there's gonna be some kind of smooth flow of that into the needed areas. But no, that's, that's oh. a lot of the sausage making that you guys yeah. do, right? Yeah, it's one thing Figuring to that out. Yeah, it's one thing to say, let's do it. And then the second piece is, well, okay, how? And so I think the how's kind of still up in the air. But some of it, and I think some of it will work smoothly, and some of it will be, there'll be, have to be a lot of wrangling or changing mm -hmm. systems. I mean, just some of the things that we're allowing today, for instance, um, the federal government is now allowed or has made people with 1099s or self employed, um, you know, sort of focusing on the gig economy to be eligible for unemployment. Well, that's great, except none of our unemployment systems, when you go on them, are able to deal with that. So we've never, that right? That's never been um, an option. So those systems have to be changed and up and running so I could go on to the unemployment system and file and they I would be accepted, right? It's like all these minute details. Um, you know, when you're a nurse and you go on to get your license and you're a nurse practitioner and you say, I'm a nurse practitioner, I want my license to be the top of, you know, at my license, there's nothing in this, the system asks you for what doctor is supervising you. Well, there's no doctor supervising you anymore. That system has to be fixed. So the level of detail that is, you know, that has to be addressed once these decisions are made are, they're they're pretty they're pretty big. Mm -hmm. so. um, you know, you had mentioned earlier uh, that uh, you're concerned and and legislation is being developed 
to address the needs of social safety net type populations. And um, we talked a little bit about the homeless, um, about folks ap applying for unemployment, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering about um, undocumented uh, people and families. Is there anything that is specifically uh, trying to address the kinds of things that might uh, be of particular pertinence to people in that situation? I know there are people working on this. I know this is a big issue. Um, it's not only an issue because it's um, kind of morally, it's not only a moral issue, like do you take care of people when they're in need, regardless of where they're from, but it's also a, a public safety issue. And we need to know who's out there and we need to know if somebody's ill and we need to take care of them because it's all part of keeping us all safe. Uh, I So I know this is an issue that's being worked on. I am not personally involved in it, um, but I know I was on a conference call the other day where um, the working group, the Senate working group that is um, working on the safety net issues brought this up and they were working on some, um, some potential uh, solutions. Okay. Um, how about uh, allocating, you know, uh, any extra money from from the state for mental health assistance? Because obviously we're all, uh, I think, aware both uh, on a person, a very personal level, and as we think about it, that the solution, you know, as we've uh, many have, have noted, the solution or a solution or a way, a path towards the solution to this uh, involves this deliberate isolating of ourselves from each other and that we know that that can't be good for us as a, as a species and as a society in general, even though we need to do it right now. So, uh, clearly that means that there are all kinds of, um, again, mental health, um, ramifications, uh, for this. Uh, is there, is there, uh, obviously there's an awareness of that. Is there, uh, are you aware of, of specific legislation or general, uh, programs that are, are, are intended to, to address that? In the very, very short term telehealth and the, um, expansion of telehealth and the requirement that it be covered, telehealth be covered is in the same way as an in, uh, in-person visit has, I think, done a lot to relieve some of that, um, some of the issues around um, access to mental health. Um, so, the, so the fact that I can now talk to you as my provider uh, by um, either video or, um, or phone helped, has helped that somewhat so people can continue to have their, their care on that level. That's a big deal. It's certainly just the first step. And I think we are having, I think there's some real concerns. Um, when somebody comes into an emergency room and they have a serious mental illness and they may be positive, a COVID-19 positive, it takes a different uh, protocol to deal with that than if you're just somebody coming in and you, you don't have a serious mental illness. And I think this is something that hospitals are grappling with right now and um, that we're trying to ensure that there is the right care and the right um, follow-up that can be um, provided for people with um, who are in that level of need. And I don't, I'm, I'm sure it's not where it needs to be. Um, and it's something that we are concerned about, really concerned about. Um, in the long term, <laughs> we're going to have a lot to deal with because, you know, the, I mean, people just talk about PTSD alone for, from this kind of event. And um, it's, it's serious. It's really serious. Um, and so I don't, but I don't think we've really started to look at that yet. Um, we know it's out there, but we haven't really, I can't tell you that we've done a good deep dive and have a great plan. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things in this area, one of the things that uh, that some folks have mentioned to me is uh, because it seems like a somewhat simple thing to address um, is the number of visits that uh, that, you know, you can have with a mental health provider, a mental health care provider or some other 
um, you know, it, whether it's therapy or something else, uh, whether that number is just can be raised from what uh, insurance companies usually allow or, um, you know, and whether legislation would be the way to do that. Yeah, I mean, that, that could very well. I know that very recently there has been a number of settlements with the attorney general and the health plans around um, their um, usage of um, prior authorization and limits to mental health care. And I know there were a number of fairly big fines and especially around inadequate provider networks, limits on uh, office visits. And um, so some of that's been relaxed and there's much more focus on ensuring that there's parity between mental health and med surge health. And we also passed a, what I think is a great um, mental health parity bill um, in the Senate recently. Um, and I would hope that that's something the House would take up with seriousness. Um, so some of that needs to be addressed because it's, you know, needs to be addressed at the state level because it's, it's illegal, right? Um, and, then, and then we need to look at where are those limits um, in, in terms of, you know, preventing people from getting access. But um, uh, I think it's a combination of, of it, enforcing the parity rules we have and then seeing what legislation might be needed to make sure that we're um, that we're making that access as available as it needs to be. A lot of it you is know, around, you know. Increasing. Sorry, go ahead. A lot of it is around rates and increasing the rates for that providers get paid for for mental health care. Um, I have to say, this conversation is a you know it's perfectly representative of most of the conversations you and I have in our lives at this point, and that is we can't get away uh, <laughs> from the virus. Let me let me uh, let me at least invite you um, to tell us about the kinds of things that were going on uh, for you a month, two months, three months ago, um, and that you know uh, you haven't had a chance to share with us uh, up till now. Um, if you can even remember back then. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. A lot of stuff were going on in the communities. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, this is the season of wonderful events and, you know, graduations and getting ready for um, uh, the summer. There were spring, you know, there was a great event at, in Billerica for um, the Council on Aging. Um, there has been enough, you know, those kinds of things where people are, um, you know, doing wonderful fundraising and, um, garden, community gardens are opening up and, you know, so I had a great calendar full of the events, a town meetings, another big one, um, that we were getting ready for at the community level. Um, and, uh, that's all just disappeared. Um, right. And then in my particular area, we've, we've had, had a lot of health care um, lined up. We had scope of practice, um, preventing, you know, telehealth was one, um, out-of-network billing. We, we have a bill on how to, uh, um, to stop surprise billing where you don't know a person is in your network and then you get the huge bill. In fact, we're, I think we're going to try and push that in the next couple of weeks because that's going to become an issue. Um, so we were working on that and, uh, pay parity between the academic hospitals and the community hospitals. These were the things that we were working on. And, uh, I know the big transportation bill was going to come out of the Senate. Um, not sure where that is. The budget. Yeah, so, I mean, really all, all of the, the normal business yep. of the Senate. Uh, has has been kind of put on hold. What what are the ramifications of that? Do you think? We'll let you know. <laughs> I guess we'll all find out, right? Because we'll out. Yeah. you know, every single day is another step into further uncharted yep. territory for for all of us. Uh, obviously, 
Um, well, I, I did want to ask, and I, I know our time is short. I just wanted to ask one more uh, quick specific question, um, and then we'll wrap up. And that is um, one, and this is in part because I have. Um, sorry. Sorry, that's fine. Uh, uh, partly because I know so many people who are caring for their parents right now, um, as well as children, et cetera. Um, and uh, in many people as well who uh, can't access folks in senior homes, in other kinds of facilities, um, even in hospice, uh, it is much more difficult to visit people who are sick and dying. Yeah. Um, is there any, um, is it even possible? And if so, is there any move towards uh, uh, creating more access in this way, Zoom, FaceTime, et cetera, uh, for people to be able to access, uh, again, those who they can no longer visit in person? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I mean, it's a really good question. And I know, I know some People are, um, you know, some facilities are working hard on creating that space, um, but I don't, I don't really know whether there's an overall plan or, mm -hmm. or how that's being addressed in any large scale way. It's a big right. problem. It's a real issue. Um, yeah, clearly so. And you know, for me to throw a laundry list of, you know, hey, how about this and how about that yeah. at you is not exactly fair, but you know, <laughs> it happens. I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, so last thing, just wrapping up. Obviously, um, we know what you're doing on our behalf, or we have a better idea of that right now and, and want to express our appreciation for it. And the fact that you guys are finding a way to do what you need to do, even in this environment. What, what about your message, either as our state senator or, or as, as Cindy? Uh, what's your message out to your, you know, to the community of Arlington and, and, and beyond, um, you know, right now? Um, what would you like to, I don't know, see from others or, or at least express? I think what I want to um, convey is how incredibly grateful I am to everyone in my communities who are taking this so seriously, um, doing the things that they're being asked of doing, uh, being, doing the things they're, they're being asked um, to do, um, to the amazing, incredible amount of kindness and thoughtfulness that I see going across all my communities um, to help people and to keep that sense of community alive. I think it's so important and get through this and we will get through it, um, follow the requests that we're making to stay apart, to, you know, to self um, uh, distance, and people are doing it and they're taking it really seriously and that is wonderful and i just want people to know that this is it's we're going to be in this for a while um there's no we don't see any short path out um to try and to keep keep the faith and um to stay patient find ways to find joy in your life and if you really are in need to reach out and to reach out to your community. I know every one of my um, uh, communities has a website and um, they have lots of information on it. They have lots of contact information. And if you need anything from us that you let me know, um, our office number is 617-722-1432. And you can go to our, um, our website as well. So. I just want to thank everybody and uh, tell everyone to keep the faith. Great. And uh, I know that you've got a number of other resources available through your website, et cetera, yeah. whether it's CDC guidelines, WHO, et cetera. Uh, so we do want to encourage people will be uh, making those uh, available on screen or otherwise um, for people to be able to access. Um, so yeah. those are, wonderful words for the community and right back at you, Cindy, um, with Thanks. those. And 
best of luck um, in continuing to do the hard and very, very important work you're doing right now. Um, and we look forward to talking to you again soon, either in this format, if necessary, or back to uh, what we're more familiar, comfortable, and, uh, and, and enjoying um, usually most of the time being in person with you. Yes, so nice. thanks for joining us. Appreciate thanks it very much. And everybody um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Okay, thanks very much. For everybody out there, this is James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We've been talking to our state senator, Cindy Friedman. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you later. <laughs>